I'm thrilled that you're here. And I would like to thank our sponsors. And I have a special thanks for Eleanor and Domenico Di Di Soleil, who have specially sponsored this program. <laughs> yes, please stand up. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's my pleasure to bring up Sue Hostetler, who will introduce today's presentation. And Sue is a trustee of Anderson Ranch, and she is also chair of our Art and Artists Advisory Committee that is responsible for pulling together the really wonderful programs that we bring you. So Sue is an author, a writer, and she is editor of the contemporary art magazine, Art Basel. Sue Hostetler. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to be introducing our little panel here today. Um, Jennifer and David Stockman are um, really phenomenal collectors as well as phenomenal people. But if you've been in their home here, you will see uh, some of the most important work from the last 20 years. Um, they are also supporters of many art institutions, very generous supporters, as well as beloved members of the uh, Aspen community. Uh, Jennifer has been a member of the museum, Guggenheim Museum Board of Trustees since 2002. She was elected president in 2005 and still holds that post. She has overseen tremendous growth at the Guggenheim, not only with its permanent collections, which continue to grow, but in, uh, in 2013, they had over 1.2 million visitors to the museum, and they hosted the most popular exhibition in New York City that year, the phenomenal, magical uh, James Terrell show. She has also been the driving force behind the museum's expansion to Dubai, which is set to open in 2017, and a proposed site in Helsinki. David Stockman, as far as I can tell, has had uh, three outstanding careers. First in the private sector at Solomon Brothers, the Blackstone Group, and at his own private equity fund, Heartland International, Heartland Industrial Partners. Then in the public sector, first as, as a congressman, and then as director of OMB for President Reagan. And finally, his exciting third act has included launching a web-based daily periodical, David Stockman's Contra Corner, featuring both his own articles and those from leading contrarian thinkers about geopolitics, economics, and finance, as well as authoring two books, Triumph of Politics, How the Re Reagan Revolution Failed, and the Great Deformation, the Corruption of Capitalism in America. Walter Isaacson is also a beloved Aspen figure, who I'm quite sure everyone in this room is, is familiar with. We all know him as the president and CEO of the brilliant Aspen Institute, but I am always personally, as a journalist, um, a little bit more impressed with his old school media credentials. He started his career in journalism at the Sunday Times of London, he then went back to his hometown to write for the New Orleans Times Picayune. In 1978, he joined Time Magazine as the political correspondent, eventually ascending to um, editor-in-chief in 1996, after which he became the CEO of CNN. He is probably, though, most widely known for his books, uh, the books that he has written, mostly biographies, including biographies on Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, and Kissinger, and of course, the international bestseller about Steve Jobs, which has been turned into a feature film coming out later this year. Please help me welcome three extraordinary individuals, Jennifer and David Stockman and Walter Isaacson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Kai and Nancy, thanks for all you do here. This is an amazing institution, and people care about art, all of you. It's great that you support it because it really helps not just art, but artists, young artists, up and coming artists, and it's one of the great institutions around. So thank you. Jennifer, let me start with you. Uh, we looked at that $1 billion week that Christie's had in May. What do these type of valuations really mean, and how does that affect the art world? Um, now, that's, that's kind of a pertinent question. Um, you know, I think a, a que you know, what maybe you're getting to is, has the art world changed? Yeah. You know, just because there's been a and billion dollar week. And we end sort of an asset at, bubble with exactly. the art world. And I would say, yes, the art world has changed because it's become an asset bubble. 
But no, it hasn't changed also for many reasons. And you know, I'd just like to <clears throat> spend a few minutes talking about some of the reasons why it hasn't changed. Okay. Um, you look back at Renaissance art, and you're becoming an expert with your n next book on Leonardo da Vinci. Um, <clears throat> the church and the Medicis and the Borghese's probably spent more money on art than even Qatar does today, which is one of the five top um, purchases of art. Um, and artists like Michelangelo uh, lived very well. They were, you know, extremely rich, money obsessed as well. Um, so looking back then, there, there, you know, there have been moments in history like that that represent things happening in today's market, but not as a trade, not using art as a tradable commodity. When you look at also the robber barons of the early 20th century, the same phenomena. You know, the Fricks, the Carnegies, J.P. Morgan, the Mellons, they either all form their own museums. Um, Mellon, you know, um, created and built the National Museum in Washington, D.C. You can say they were monuments to themselves. Um, they used art, mostly Renaissance art, um, as a tool to gain power and prestige, as is being the done. The yeah. Like the, yes, or, or you can even say some of the, Russians or Chinese today, or some of even the hedge fund people. I'm sorry if I'm going to insult anybody in the audience, but I think <laughs> art has always been looked at as a way to, or this is crude, but to perf perfume the pig. So all throughout history, 500 years <laughs> of history, really hasn't changed that phenomena. Yeah, but so, there's a phenomenon mm -hmm. now where the Medici's when they created art, it was for display, it was for the art's sake, they wanted it. Now a lot of this art, and you can tell me what percentage, seems to be traded not for the value of the art, mm. but as a commodity that's sometimes even kept in vaults in Switzerland or right, something. Right, right. Well, the, the art world today is a 50, 60 mil, uh, billion dollar world, so it's a real business today. Uh, contemporary art alone is 10 billion of that, wow. which is very significant. And 50, the top 50 artists are four billion, represent four billion of that number. So contemporary art is really a serious business. I don't think it's something that's going away. I think there's so much money that has rushed into this market recently um, that, that these investors slash speculators are looking at art as a way to diversify their portfolios. Certainly there's been few returns in bonds or stocks or even real estate as good as art. Um, and it's a way, in some cases, to launder money. You know, there's a whole corrupt, darker, so what seedier percentage side of, this. of that 50 billion? Mm -hmm. Do you think is being done for speculative and uh, financial and money laundering purposes versus for the value of the art itself? And well, should we worry about that? Um, you know, it is a concern. I don't know what we can really do about it because a lot of art, if it's being bought by foreign buyers, are being put in tax-free havens and so forth. And I don't know, if, you know, the, the sad thing to me is that it's possible that we'll never see that art again. And these are masterpieces they're buying. I mean, you know, we're talking about these investor-type collectors spending way more than $10 million on a piece of art. And to have it lost to the world would be a real, you know, would be a disaster. So it, it remains to be seen what's going to happen. With now, it. you said Qatar is number five. Right. I assume the U.S. and Britain are one and two. Yep. Is that yep. China and Russia, three um, and four? China is, that's another very significant thing that's happened in this world. China is a huge player. Of the 100 top contemporary artists, 47 are Chinese. I mean, that is, you know, a new I'm phenomenon. I'm sorry, uh, of the top, by top you mean by what people pay for them? Yes, uh, I'm looking at auction records. Mm -hmm. So not even private sales. The numbers are even higher if you look at private sales. So this is all public au auction records. Um, Do you mind if I turn mm -hmm. to David for one second? Yeah. Which is, <laughs> no, it's okay. I have a feeling, and I think you do as well, that the asset bubble in China is about to burst. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And then I'm gonna ask Jennifer, what will that mean for the art world? Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, but before you get too worried about it, I just have to, dis I want you to be able to discount what I have to say going forward. <laughs> uh, Sue was kind enough to remind all of you that after 40 years, I've never held a steady job. So <laughs> you can keep that in mind. And also that I'm an itinerant book writer. My last book, The, uh, the Great Deformation, uh, was number four 
on the New York Times bestseller book list. Um, but I'm not bragging because a year later they're still debating whether that was number four in the fiction or the nonfiction yeah. category. <laughs> so I will be talking about economics and bubbles, uh, but you might uh, keep that in mind. There is a global bubble. Uh, China is the leading edge of it. We'll get into it, but I think it relates to the art world, unfortunately, because this global financial bubble has turned art into a asset class like almost everything else in the financial world, and that creates serious, serious problems, I think, about valuations. Wait, wait, when you call it an asset class, most asset classes are commodities. Right. The definition of a commodity is that it's generally interchangeable. One barrel of oil is right. interchangeable. With that. Are you do you are you defining art now as sort of a commodity? Uh, I'm defining. Uh, I mean, what, historically, real financial assets were grounded in income. In other words, the stock is the present value of the dividends, or a bond is the present value of the interest stream uh, discounted for whatever risk. Because we're in a world where there's a massive financial bubble, and I'll just say I think it's 300 trillion big. Uh, and that no longer relates to the underlying GDP of the world or income. Uh, what has happened is that valuations of everything in that 300 trillion financial system of the world have become decoupled from underlying uh, economics or income. And when that happens, stocks can soar, bonds of Greece can get way overvalued a year ago, and you can see where they are today. But in that environment, almost anything can become a tradable asset class because it doesn't have to be anchored in income. Obviously, art produces no income. It's supposed to produce enjoyment. It's supposed to produce enlightenment. It does all of those things, but because of this financial world, I believe it's been sucked in to the general inflation of asset classes. Therefore, art is tremendously uh, inflated in value, not uniquely, but along with everything else. And so therefore, the outlook going forward depends on what you think about this global so bubble. So Jennifer, what yeah. does that mean for the art world collectors? I just think collectors have to be very careful and not buy for, I mean, if I were advising a collector, I would never tell them to buy art as an asset. It's far too dangerous. And the press only talks about the art going up and the huge sales, but there's a lot of art that's going down as well. So let, let, explain that to me. Most assets can go up and down a bit, gold, copper, right. oil, we watch it every day. Can a contemporary artist, the fluctuation downward is what, 10 times greater than any other type of asset, you think? Well, I wouldn't know if it was 10 times, yeah. but I know there's a huge fluctuation. And you know, don't, let's not forget that at auction, it only takes two people. You know, it's, not, it's a very thin market sometimes that can drive a price way up. <clears throat> and uh, you know, in the case of Warhol, where it's a very deep market, you're not going to see, I don't think, those kind of fluctuations. But for all of a sudden, a new name artist like an Oscar Murillo, who's been getting a lot of press lately, his prices have gone up to a million, and he's maybe 30. I don't even, you know, he's very young. You know, I think it's really questionable whether he can, he can stay at that level. And it's also really unfair to the artists. It's not their fault when their prices go like that. And I think it makes it very difficult for them to you know, um, ignore the market. Well, that's and fascinating. How do you think it affects the artists themselves when the art world gets uh, somewhat, shall we say, disjointed from underlying realities? Well, I think, first of all, artists, the, the real artists have always managed to make art through wars, through depressions, through poverty, through anarchism, through disease, whatever. You know, somehow art has always survived. Mm -hmm. So I think art will survive also economic fluctuations and so forth. I think the smart artists brace themselves. You know, they don't get carried away. They, they don't even look at their auction results. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they care about where their work is placed. You know, are they going to certain collections? <clears throat> are museums buying the art? That is an appropriate focus for an artist. But to actually be watching auction records and how they're, you know, what prices their art it sells for, I think can really 
destroy, um, you know, the artist. I really do. What, David, geopolitical trends right now, from Greece to Russia to China, mm. whatever, are affecting the art world and in some ways maybe distorting the art market? Well, I think you have to put it in context, if I can do that first, because we've been talking a lot about art and uh, its relationship to the financial bubble. But the truth is, if you take, according to the estimates we see, all of the transactions in the fine art world, and we're not just talking about contemporary, we're talking about everything, um, it's about 50 billion a year. Now, as I said before, the total value of the financial system in the world, bonds, stocks, is 300 trillion. And so therefore, the financial system of the world is 6,000 times bigger than the art, work, uh, art market. And therefore, you might say that art is a rounding error in the scheme of things. Now, I noticed the chairman of Sotheby's is here, yeah. and he was kind enough to sponsor this event, and so he's happy he to learn that he's now. a rounding error. <laughs> but uh, I think you need to have that perspective. On the other hand, the, the point I'm trying to get at, Walter, is that this 300 billion worth of stuff out, 300 trillion, I'm sorry, worth of stuff out there is not really grounded in the uh, production and work and labor and real income of the world economy. Why do I say that? Because if we go back 27 years, and I take 1987 as a starting point, that's when Alan Greenspan became chairman of the Fed. He discovered they had a printing press in the basement, and before long we were off to the races. The other central banks of the world began to do the same thing. Here's the point. Back 30 years ago, rounded, the uh, total value of um, the stocks and bonds and financial system of the world was 30 trillion. It's now 300 trillion. It's up 10 times. The total GDP of the world may be as triple what it was 30 uh, years ago. So what has happened is that financial values have become uncoupled from the real income, the real production, uh, the real value being generated by all kinds of people working in the world economy. And the reason for it is the central banks, printing money like there's no tomorrow, driving interest rates to zero, monetizing trillions of dollars worth of debt. We can go into the whole thing. But what that does is drive uh, the creation of debt, funds massive speculation and so-called financialization uh, of the world economy in a way that was unimaginable 20 or 30 years ago. In the process, everything gets caught up. And so therefore, everything got uh, overexpanded, overvalued, and now I think we're on uh, you know, the cusp of a major adjustment. Greece and China are only kind of the fractures and the, uh, you know, the breaks that are beginning to appear, but I believe the whole thing is unstable, and unfortunately, that will affect the art world uh, just like uh, everything else. Well, you call the it the corruption of capitalism. Is right. the root of that the uh, ability to print money? Yeah, I think the root of this corruption is not that there are lots of people inventing things, uh, the yeah. innovators that you talk about, or that uh, we've had tremendous strides in technology, or that China has come out of the rice paddies and you know, the uh, red uh, uh, communism of Mao to become the red <laughs> capitalism today. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is central banks around the world have basically destroyed price discovery in financial markets and have created way too much uh, ease in terms of the ability to borrow, the ability to carry debt, the ability to use debt to speculate in every uh, kind of uh, class of assets imaginable. Uh, we have today $22 trillion worth of balance sheets in the central banks of the world. Uh, at the time that Alan Greenspan became chairman of the Fed, that's only 30 years ago, the total balance sheets of the central banks were less, you know, they, were, they weren't even $1 trillion. So all of that has really uh, created this mother of all bubbles 
And I don't think you can really talk about what's going on in the art world without recognizing that context. Mm-hmm. So, Jennifer, I, I see how hard it must be to be married to David. Um, and so to move us from the gloom and doom, give us, because uh, this new interest in art must also create some new good trends of uh, people valuing art, people you know, helping the art world. Tell us the trends in the art world that you find more optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> well... You know, artists, first of all, there's never been as many artists as there are today. Maybe they've existed, but we certainly didn't know about them in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, all over the world. Um, and, and it's creating such an interesting dialogue among themselves, but also, you know, in the, art, in the larger art community. They're, they're adding, you know, so much. Either they're commenting on what's happening in their unique countries, their social... Yeah you know, commentaries, but they're adding a lot of information into this world. Well, give me an example, and because you said that 47 of the top 100 contemporary mm-hmm. artists by auction price are in China. Um, how is that adding to the dialogue elsewhere? I mean, what are they bringing into this uh, art world dialogue? Okay, that's, um, you know, I don't know if I would focus on the 47, because yeah. I think they tend to be more market artists. Um, and not, not, you know, just because an artist is a market artist also doesn't mean that they don't have anything worthwhile to say. You know, often it's separated, and that's mm-hmm. unfortunate. But I think, um, you know, especially with artists from India, um, from uh, Chinese artists, from Middle Eastern artists, um, the recent Biennale in Venice, these artists talk about the hardships in their countries, uh, the wars, the civil wars, you know, what they've experienced with, um, you know, with death and, you know, really, really some dark, uh, tough issues that I don't think we would have any way of knowing if it weren't for the artists. I, must, I just came and back from the Biennale. I must admit it was rather dark. Dark. Mm. It was dark this year. And it was very criticized for being so dark because it was such a, you know, specific perspective. But, you know, the world right now is a dark place. And artists have always been... The, the, the best people, and it can be music, musicians as well, it doesn't have to be visual artists in every case, to, to you know, give um, a real insider, honest, authentic viewpoint of what's really happening. Because often in some of these countries, the press is controlled, you know, that there's no allow, look at Ai Weiwei's situation in China. I mean, he mm-hmm. until recently wasn't even allowed to have an exhibition in China. You know, they, they look at him as a rebel, and China, China is such a capitalistic country in so many ways, but yet it's not. So um, artists are, are the ones in the forefront really dealing with these hard issues. So I think they offer, regardless of the market value or the bubble or whatever, they offer such an important, tangible um, asset to society. At the Guggenheim, you know, you've done more than most, I guess, any museum in terms of international expansions. Uh, whether it be Venice or Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, You mentioned earlier the Fricks and the Morgans wanting their own museums. What are the trends in the museum world? Are there going to be multiple of these collectors having their own museums, or is the Guggenheim going to have much more influence around the world, or both? Um, You know, both. I would say Mm. both, because if you look at... I was just reading this, actually. The top 100 collectors... You know, there's always a list put out, mm. the top 100 collectors. And something like 20% of them are building their own foundations, mm. museums. So it's, you know, these, this is proliferating all over the world. We're seeing it a lot in the U.S. as well. Now, why should a museum care about this or should a museum be concerned about this? Um, you know, because obviously a museum would like the collections of these collectors rather than have the collectors give them to their own foundation. That's number one. But museums, you know, one of the main thing a museum does is try not to do what the market wants them to do. You know, they're anti-commodity. They, you know, so, so as prices are getting more and more expensive, it's forcing museums, and I actually think it's a good thing, to look for you know, younger artists, there's more of a focus on younger emerging artists to look outside of our own boundaries, you know, in Southeast Asia and Latin America. Um, 
and, and to you know, develop those kind of opportunities. Someday those artists may become the market artists, but right now they're extremely accessible, affordable, and doing some really important work. So what would you advise a collector of contemporary art to do right now? Um, well, the one thing is a lot of people are gun shy, I think, because of the market and all these huge numbers. Um, but another very inter interesting statistic that Domenico knows is that there's over 200,000 works of art available at auction in any given year under $10,000. Mm -hmm. So, and, and something like, I don't know, uh, 100,000 under $5,000. So it's an accessible market at any level of, you know, we're, we're anything you can really afford. And there's a lot of choice as well. So I would definitely... Uh, tell a collector not to be intimidated by the market, and there's plenty of excellent things to consider. <clears throat> and the idea of reading and seeing is so important. You know, going to museum shows, just becoming knowledgeable. <clears throat> and, you know, one can hire an advisor, and that's sometimes useful, a useful thing to do, but often to go yourself to the museum shows, to the galleries, to talk to the gallerists, to find galleries, I see Marion Boski here, mm -hmm. to, you know, to talk to Marion and to get familiar and with Anne her. And Cora Logos, too. We have and to go Anne, to Anne, Anne, see, I'm so much <laughs> in the contemporary, of course, <laughs> Anne. But to get familiar with their stable of artists and to see which, which artists represent your own taste and so forth, because having relationships with gallerists are very important. And um, is there, in, you talk about contemporary, modern, all the way back, is there any period of art that you think is undervalued now? Well, certainly American art, American Western art is undervalued. There's an opportunity. I think there's so much focus on contemporary art, but because there's so many people in the contemporary art world who are invest, smart investors and speculators, they're looking to bottom feed too. You know, so they're looking for the opportunity and they're looking in the modern and impressionist sales. Mm -hmm. And those sales have been doing better. By the way, the modern impressionist sales actually uh, uh, have higher revenues uh, in total than the contemporary sales. Uh, oh, Everybody right. thinks it's contemporary is number right. one, but modern, modern and impressionism is still number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but yet, with that said, there's still many opportunities there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think Renaissance painting is probably, if you can find any, or drawings <laughs> would be... We, <laughs> Well, at least it's not a uh, asset that's increasing. There's a no, limited, limited number of number. Renaissance paintings. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe a few more added each year, but they're all fake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, uh, if you were to uh, look at the art market as a market, and you were to look at, say, the equity market as a market, which is a more rational market? <laughs> have you, uh, David, well, you? you know, before I answer that, I think I'm in danger of being misunderstood with all this bubble talk, because I think actually it is a wonderful thing for the art world, at least in the short run. The resources that are flowing in, really. Yeah. Uh, there are more galleries, there are more young artists getting started, there is more money flowing to public institutions, private mm -hmm. institutions, mm -hmm. new uh, museums being started uh, everywhere by private collectors. So this is, in some ways, a golden age. Now, I, that was brought home to me when we were at the Biennale uh, a few weeks ago and went to the main pavilion and right in the center of the main pavilion is a performance art piece mm -hmm. happening and I stood to watch and there are two people at podiums reading, taking turns reading back and forth to each other, Das Kapital uh, <laughs> by Karl Marx. So uh, th my point about that is there is enough resources to basically fund and to support and cause to flourish almost an unbelievable array of different approaches and things. Now, I think it's important f for me to say that because my start in the art world was 1981 when I was budget director in the Reagan administration and my, uh, one of the items on my list was to kill the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs> and uh, I became somewhat famous for that, but the, the point is... <laughs> <laughs> the point is, back then, the budget, I think, was $150 million or something like that. It was probably somewhat important in terms of the resources that were flowing into the art world, particularly for younger uh, artists. Mm -hmm. 
But today, when you talk about the kind of art world that has been able to emerge or float up on this great financial bubble, and these values that you see at auction, and uh, all of the uh, networks of support in the massive expansion of collectors, it makes uh, the National Endowment for the Arts a rounding error, truly. Uh, and that, I think, you know, in a 30-year period uh, or so, uh, is a, a real change. So uh, the world financial system is probably got a few years yet uh, before the big uh, bust comes. And I think the uh, issue for the art world is what happens when there is a major correction. Not like 2000, that was bad enough, the dot com. Not like 207 or 208, which was pretty brutal, but probably something uh, even more uh, earth shattering. Uh, I think it's going to, uh, ter you know, it's going to cause everything uh, to go uh, into turmoil, and uh, the, the art world just needs to be prepared for it. That's all. I hear, I do hear this constantly. As I, <laughs> <laughs> it's very encouraging when you when you actually fall in love with art and you can't yeah. resist, you know, having it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so before we go to the audience for questions, was there any other thoughts you had? I know we talked some earlier thing, themes that you were talking about that you feel is important for this conversation. Um, you know, I was thinking a little bit about you know a museum's role in this very new environment, very tough environment, and the idea of being um, anti-commodity, I think, is is really interesting. Not that all museums are. But you know, we've seen the rise of performance art, mm -hmm. and occasionally we see the rise of grotesque art or um, apocalyptic art or whatever. And often that's artists' reactions too against the market, which is so artists themselves are reacting. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it's interesting how they often would shoot themselves in the foot by trying to make art that's not sellable, like performance art. I mean, it is sellable, but it's very difficult to buy a performance piece. It's yeah. definitely... To it's, have two people in your living have, room yeah, reading yeah, a yeah, dust exactly. to each other. After a while, not, you would want to uh, deaccession that. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, you know, you wonder why this rise of performance art has all of a sudden happened. And I think it is related to artists' reactions. Mm -hmm. You know, when Cindy Sherman was gaining in fame, um, I guess in the early 90s, that's when she made her grotesque series. And she said, well, nobody, you know, her prices were rising and rising. And she said, nobody's going to want to buy these. And she was wrong. People still wanted to buy them. How does it and change museums uh, to have performance art be much more part of the equation? Um, well, you know, museums, probably unlike foundations or any other place, can can have those kind of exhibitions. The Guggenheim had Tino Segal. Sure. I think um, the MoMA had Marino Bramovic. And these were, you know, really made, the lines were around the block in both cases to see it. I think people had a hard time getting their arms around what it meant, um, especially Tino Segal, where there was nothing on the walls, nothing didactic on the walls. There was no catalog, no brochure. As a matter of fact, the Guggenheim bought a piece which was really quite a funny acquisition meeting because there was no description, written description. There was no invoice. He, told, he mentioned how much it was, but uh, you know, and there's, and how do we, once he's gone, how does the museum reenact it? So these are the challenging issues that I think museums are uniquely able to deal with. How was that and board meeting? It was very difficult, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they went along with it, you know, and we're very happy because mm -hmm. Tina Segal is very important as Marino Bramovic, the whole idea of performance art, which is not new, by the way. It's been around well, since the boys' days and so forth. Wait, wait, that's what and Leonardo spent most of his time doing is performance art in Milan. Yeah, that's true. Which, by the way, is not accessible that's, these days, so that's yeah. a bit of a problem. Yeah, at yeah. least today you can record it, even though Tino Segal didn't even want his recorded. Right. You know, or, ta or photographs. So you couldn't even buy a photograph of it. So, you know. That's, well, yeah. that goes Thanks. beyond my comprehension, which yeah, is why I'm glad uh, I'm not on your board. <laughs> <laughs> Let me open it up. Did you all want to, Annie, you want to start? All right, question here. We have, uh, I think there's a, yeah, yeah. 
Is your prediction for the next downturn, which you say is going to be worse than 08, which seems unimaginable, is it related to the banks again, or is it a different sector that will take everything down? No, I think this time it's not the banks. Uh, this time I think it's like the junk bond market, it's the mutual funds, the corporate debt that's been created massively, it's the emerging market uh, debt that's been created. But uh, the leading edge of it is really China, and uh, everybody thinks it's some kind of great miracle, but it is actually one of the greatest Ponzi schemes in human history. <laughs> and I'll just give you one number that I think gives you some sense of it. In the year 2000, there was less than $2 trillion of debt outstanding in China. There is now $28 trillion. Uh, there, and that's about two and a half or three times their GDP. You, now, the point is without the debt to GDP ratio, is that higher three, than we've ever seen in any country before? Uh, it's about as high as it gets. Ours is three and a half times. I was going to so, okay. point that out. All right, so we have 60 trillion. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing when it happens in 15 years in a relatively immature economy that really doesn't have much of a judicial system or contract law or uh, you know experience uh, with financial markets over decades and decades it's not institutionalized when this much debt just pours into the system and then that money is used to build wildly uh, and you know all about the, the empty apartment buildings there's 60 million empty apartment units in China there's dozens of cities that were built for a million people that are empty there are roads and bridges and you know you can go on that uh, are dramatically underutilized so it caused a boom when all of this credit was funding uh, uh, the greatest as I say construction investment boom in history but now that is beginning to stop and the uh, what I call the red capitalists uh, of Beijing are desperate to see how they can keep the ball in the air that's what all this stock market turmoil has been about uh, in the last year. But let, let me just uh, give you some idea why I think it's dangerous and that it could spread to the rest of the world. Uh, on March 17th of this year, um, the stock market of uh, China was 3,500. By uh, June 12th, which is only about uh, 60 trading days, it was at 5,100. That was three and a half trillion of new stock market value created in 60 days in uh, the casino in uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen. 20 days later, it was back to 3,500. In other words, in 80-day round trip, 3.5 trillion was created, 3.5 trillion disappeared, and this is a, uh, I think, kind of indicator or measure of how shaky and how uh, dangerous and unstable the uh, e economic system and financial uh, uh, environment is in China. Now, when China breaks, and I think it will, it will cause, you know, uh, tidal waves of deflation throughout the world because today, uh, scratch uh, anybody on Wall Street or somebody who believes in all this, and they'll tell you that China is the locomotive that's pulling the world economy forward. Not going to happen. And so, uh, the place to look, I think, this time is China, the emerging markets, Europe, which is a disaster, uh, but we'll uh, we'll, well, we'll all up. go out of this in short <laughs> China this <laughs> afternoon. But uh, not to sound more like a defender of free markets than Reagan's OMB director yeah. or somebody, <laughs> this is a free market. There are markets of people buying bonds, they're buying assets at the stock market in Shanghai and in the United States. They're buying art in a free market auction system. Why do you think the markets are so dumb? Uh, the markets aren't dumb. They're, being, uh, they're doing what they're being told to do. And so therefore, uh, if uh, debt is being made available at virtually zero cost, I mean, the overnight market is zero. Uh, the federal funds rate has been zero for seven years, almost 80 months. Well, why does that cause a $3 because trillion dollar allowed... roller coaster in a 28-day period? Oh, in China, because it was all done on margin debt. Uh, okay. In March, in China, the amount of margin, which, you know, margin loans to buy stock, outstanding, was around $100 billion. Uh, 60 days later, it was 400 billion. I mean, this is crazy. Nothing like this happens. So the, when the stock market started going up and the uh, easy margin loans became available, 30 million new trading accounts were opened in 60 days. These, these are crazy kind of things that in even our casino in Wall Street, 
no one could imagine. So everybody borrowed like hell. They pledged their empty apartments in order to get cash, to put it in the market. They all thought they were getting rich, and in 20 days, the whole thing and disappeared. And Jennifer, what percent of people in the art market now, just generally, just as a rough guess, do you think are just pure financial speculators because it's better than trying to buy bonds when there's zero interest rates or they want to shield assets versus wanting it for the art for art's sake? Uh, you know, I would almost guess 50 percent. Wow. Because there's, you, Is the, that the highest the reason, in history? You know, you know, I just say it because there's so many new collectors entering the art world now. And I think a lot of their interest has peaked because they hear about the values going up. Not that they would call themselves speculators, but I think they think that they're putting their money in a good, safe place. And they're putting it in vaults in Zurich, too, as and opposed into museums. Right, right. right. Way back with the, yeah. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for all that you do for, for art. Uh, David, I'm, I was a vegetarian <laughs> state uh, senate candidate last election year. I'm a big fan of yours at the Lit Spring Conference. I wouldn't have <laughs> But uh, uh, can I ask you, in reference to uh, your ideas on a minimum wage, uh, I, I wanted you to maybe speak on that, in, in, a, in a place that's very unequal, like Aspen. <laughs> um, well, look, I, I think this is pretty far afield. I don't think the minimum wage helps anybody. It destroys jobs. Uh, it is a very bad idea, and especially when we have to compete in a world market where there's a free flow of capital and labor and goods. So I think it's a rotten idea. But I do believe, I realize that people who are working hard and their work is only worth $7 an hour can't support a family. The answer to that is the earned income tax credit. That's what we have, and it basically says if you earn uh, you know, $15,000 a year, we'll top it up with another five or $10,000 from the taxpayer. That's what we ought to do because it doesn't interfere with the market. It doesn't discourage uh, employers from creating jobs if they're only able to pay $7 an hour or $8 an hour because that's uh, the competitive value. Uh, so, uh, you know, th that um, I think uh, is uh, the way to look at it, but unfortunately, uh, we have this income distribution issue which has nothing to do with whether the minimum wage is too high or low. It has to do with this massive financial bubble that ends up benefiting the one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent of the population. Because when the central banks fuel this bubble, when you have zero cost of carry night after night to speculate in stocks and bonds and commodities and even art for that matter, the people that can mobilize the capital and that can access uh, the uh, cheap money markets end up with huge windfalls. They may not last, but for right now they're there. That's what's showing up in the statistics. And as a result of that, even though we've had this enormous increase in the value uh, of the stock market that I mentioned uh, before, the, med the median uh, real income of households in America today is no higher, 53,000, than it was when Alan Greenspan started this whole thing in 1987. In other words, uh, back then Warren Buffett was worth $2 billion. He's worth $73 billion today. Back then, the financial market was $10 uh, uh, trillion big in the United States. It's $100 trillion today. Back then, the average wage uh, weekly in real dollars was three seventy dollars a week for full-time workers. Today, it still is. In other words, uh, the production and labor and effort going into the economy uh, is totally disconnected or, de or decoupled from these massive windfall financial values going to a tiny, tiny fraction of the people who can benefit uh, from the, the inflation of financial assets and the speculative casino that uh, Wall Street and London and the other financial markets have been turned into. Uh, right there with the hand up. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Stand up, yeah, 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 thank you. Excuse me. Last week we heard a wonderful ceramic artist here. And I'd like to know if you could speak to the controversy of craft versus fine art. 
where it's moving over. Some of us are moving over, others are not. <laughs> not, not the user, maybe the cup or the mug or whatever. I'm talking about very contemporary ceramics glass fiber. It's such a good question, and it, and it applies. I assume that was for me, not David. <laughs> no, but the good Lord's thunderbolt was for David. <laughs> um, you know, what we're seeing and what we've really been seeing over the past 10 years is this merging of every kind of medium that, calls, I mean, that is called contemporary art, and that's glass work, um, ceramic work. I mean, some of the main dealers in Chelsea have ceramic shows that are, you know, look at Andrew Lord. Um, I mean, some of the ceramic artists are just fantastic. Um, and you could say the same with art merging with fashion. Uh, Raf Simmons at Christian Dior is, he, we saw him in Basel. He's at every fashion, at every art show. You know, he's very inspired by art. Um, as are a lot of the other fashion houses. Look at cars, you know, design. I mean, design now at uh, Design Basel is almost as big as the art fair. I don't think in revenues yet, but it's really gaining in popularity. But do you time. think design is better now as an art form, other than, I'll say, Apple Computer is doing yeah. it well, than it was in the 50s and 60s when Herbert Beyer helped build this? Well, it's hard to say because the 50s and 60s is so hot right now. And everybody is now looking back, and that's what people look toward. And they're very, and artists are inspired by looking at art and design from the 50s and 60s. So I can't, I think it's more interesting. And um, you see the use of technology as well in design. Mm -hmm. The way you saw design in technology, there's also the reverse. So I, I really think there's opportunities for artists working in any kind of medium. And I would, you asked earlier what I'd advise a collector. I really think, even though painting, p collectors prefer painting, I think 60% of collectors prefer painting over photography or uh, drawings or prints or anything else. Uh, but I would advise a collector to look at other mediums, look at sculpture, look at drawing, look at photography. And not only- What about digital? Digital, fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Wade, uh, help me, why am I drawing a blank? Thank you, Wade Guyton at the Whitney uh, had, a, had a show that was all about new technology and so forth. Um, and we're seeing more and more. Artists are very adept, as Leonardo was, of looking at technology and using technology for their artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, there's even a documentary on, um, on Vermeer Mm -hmm. And did he paint freehand or did he use technology? Mm -hmm. And the thesis of this documentary is some say he cheated because he used technology. But I think technology is very much part of contemporary art. Well, yes, Leonardo sir. used the compass to make Vitruvian man, so we yeah. can allow the use of tools. Uh, yes, brother, questions? No, please don't be shy here. Yes, right there and there. But Yes, the person with the mic. Uh, for David Stockman, Hillary Clinton, among others, have proposed doing away with the uh, carried interest tax formula for hedge fund people. How do you think that will affect uh, collectors in the art market? Well, uh, I think uh, the carried interest for hedge funds and uh, private equity is an abomination. And uh, it should have been repealed long ago, and it's the first time I've ever agreed with Hillary Clinton, but I'm gonna have to on that. Uh, secondly, there is still so much uh, 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 froth in the financial market that these PE guys and hedge fund guys are making uh, more money than you can count, and as long as that's happening, uh, they'll be buying art, and so I think the effect will be small. Uh, I do think, though, I want to emphasize once again that notwithstanding all this bubble uh, in the world uh, financial system, it has been, in the near term and maybe longer, a good thing for art. And we're at Anderson Ranch, which is a place for artists, and this enormous flow of resources clearly has been a good thing. And we were looking at some data just to prepare for this, and I think you know, it's hard to measure things because everybody argues about how valid the statistics are and so forth, but the one that I saw that I thought was interesting was one of the art magazines puts out sales at auction for the top 10 artists under 30 
over time. Now, obviously, it's a different set of people each time because they get older. But I think it measures where the system is going. Ten years ago, the top ten under 30 artists sold $140,000 worth of stuff in the three big auction houses in a one-year cycle. Five years ago, the top ten different people sold two million. In the last wow. cycle, 214, they sold 10 million. Now, I think this is great for the ten top emerging young artists, although they were different in each class. But I think it's a measure of the incentive, of the opportunity that's out there that is causing uh, the flourishing of arts like we've never seen before. Unfortunately, these uh, eras don't last, but when they do, uh, they, cr they uh, generate an enormous amount of creativity, enormous amount of contribution, uh, and that's all to the good. We just need to recognize that um, you know, it comes and goes. <laughs> well, the era of the Medici's didn't last yeah. either, but it produced this great mm -hmm. wealth of art. Mm -hmm. Do you see a comparison in a way that we're having a great explosion of I do. art? I do. I think, as I said earlier, there are moments in time. The Renaissance, I think, before the, before the Renaissance, artists were not supported like they were during the Renaissance. I, I see the early, late 19th century, early 20th century as another, you know, and it all is tied to wealth, basically. Mm. You have to be able to afford to pay artists mm. to do major projects. Why do we have the and big burst in the early 1900s? Why didn't we have Why it? Why did we? I mean, we did with modernism. Yes, yes. Uh, <sighs> well, I, you know, I would go back to, to the robber barons again. You know, they had a lot of money that they were looking. It wasn't even investment. They were looking to uh, either create monuments for themselves or get some sophistication, cultural. Uh, you, you know, it was considered very prestigious to have important paintings in your home. Um, so I, I think that they were spending a lot of money on art. And Duveen, who was the dealer back then, he was the major dealer who, who sold to all of those guys, or most of them. He even tried to sell to Edsel Ford, but Edsel didn't want to have anything to do with art. He liked his cars. But, um, I, you know, and Duveen was a great salesman. Berenson also. They were kind Bernard of a team Berenson, for a while. Yeah. Exactly. So I think it was an interesting moment in time. You can compare it today to Gagosian what's happening with some of the top dealers, with the, this influx of so much capital and money and some great gallerists and salespeople. You know, they're doing a great job branding their artists and um, attracting a lot of attention, mm -hmm. you know, and... Yes, with the hat. <laughs> Those who? The barons those, were those not barons, supporting. That's true. Those they were barons, Renaissance. That's those true. barons were not involved with contemporary life, or contem I mean, with contemporary artists. Oh, There's a true. big distinction here. So yeah, I just, that's true. Who okay. was supporting they them? Were ba the yeah. People like, ba they were talking about walking in. Uh, it's true that it was all about prestige, because they were buying works where uh, they would walk in and say, do I smell wet paint here? That yeah. was an indication that you had bought a fake. It was all about mm -hmm. the, tr the, the, the old treasures and the expensive treasures. It was not of anything to do with contemporary art. People like the Cone sisters in Baltimore who went to Europe and lived in Paris and supported people like Picasso and Matisse, they were, they, they were the people in the trenches with the artists and in and, and, and living with them and, in, and participating in, in contemporary life. Anyway, just I would I agree with correction. you. And I would add Peggy Guggenheim to that too. Yeah, you know, true. she was sleeping with them and buying their <laughs> art and having, having a great time. But as a result, oh, yeah. the Peggy Guggenheim wow. has a great collection. Um, and that's now it out does. in the documentary. And if you, you didn't uh, hear get it from depressed by the Biennale, <laughs> just get a water taxi and yeah, go exactly. to the Peggy Guggenheim Museum. Yeah. You know, on that note of Peggy Guggenheim, I'd like to just sum up with one thought, okay. which is that between the doom and gloom of the uh, bubble bursting and the wonderful golden age we're reaching now, it does seem that the most important thing you can do is to buy art because you truly value That's it right. as art and you truly appreciate the artists making it. And that's the theme of the Anderson Ranch as well. So, Nancy, thank you for having us. The Stockmans, yeah. congratulations yeah. on your oh, award. Oh, I'm clapping. I'm clapping for you. Uh